Well, good evening everybody. This is a, a Sunday of firsts for many of us. Um, I don't think I've ever preached in slippers before, but uh, so it's a first for me. It's a first too for uh, us to present this uh, service on the internet. We thank Simon for what he did this morning, and we ask that the Lord would bless us this evening as we meet together once again virtually around his word. So to start this uh, service this evening, we're going to uh, read from the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah, which is what Jim shared with us on uh, Tuesday evening at the prayer meeting. And so I'm going to read the first nine verses of Isaiah 55. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters of life. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk, without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David, indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people, a leader and a commander for the people. Surely you shall call a nation you do not know, and nations who you do not know, know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than than your ways, and my thoughts, than your thoughts. Let's be encouraged by that reading from the word of God, that God is in control, as the world seems to be in such a panic and a concern naturally at this time. We pray that the Lord's uh, overwhelming uh, power and authority would be seen and known in, among, in and amongst us, even today. We're going to take our hymn books and we're going to look at the first hymn that I've chosen, which is number 637, uh, 637, and I'm just going to read the verses. It's got a chorus, but I shall read that at the first and last. All I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world reveres and wars to own. All I once thought gain, I have counted loss spent and worthless now compared to this knowing you jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and i love you lord now my heart's desire is to know you more to be found in you and known as yours to possess by faith what I could not earn, all surpassing gift of righteousness. Oh, to know the power of your risen life, and to know you in your sufferings, to become like you in your death, my Lord, so with you to live and never die. Knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all, you're the best. You're my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Now, for our contemplations and thoughts this evening, uh, I just want to introduce my sermon so you know exactly where we're going and what we're going to be thinking about uh, this evening. So, we all have them from before we're born to after we die, every moment of every day. Some are personal some corporate, 
as individuals, couples, families, churches, workplaces, towns, counties, countries, continent, and the planet. All has them. Plants, machines, telephones, animate and inanimate things. What are they? They all have needs. And that's what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening. I prepared this sermon some two or three weeks ago, and uh, with the events that have transpired over the past week, it's become evident to me that this sermon is necessarily not only for me, but hopefully for those that we're sharing it with over the internet, even this evening. So as we come, let's bow our heads together and let's all pray. That's the beauty of prayer. We don't have to be together, but the Lord hears everything we say when we approach the throne of grace. So let's bow our heads and pray together. Almighty and eternal God, and our ever-loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming directly into your presence, to that throne of grace, where we can find grace to help us in our time of need. And Father, even today, we are in great need. It's not just us, dear Lord, it's not just our county, our country, but this world is in such a great need, both physically and spiritually. And we thank you that we come to the God who is the King of Kings and the Lord of all lords. So our Father, we come and we worship and we praise you for who you are. We thank you for what you have done, you are doing, and you will continue to do, because you are the sovereign, almighty God. And so, as we come to you in our prayers this evening, we thank you that you hear, and that you answer, and that your will and your way is always best. So, Father, give us that strength to abide in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give us the ability to rely upon our God, not to panic, not to be afraid, because God is in control and his will and his way is always perfect. Father, there are many in our church, in our fellowship, in our world today that are frightened and are scared of the future. None of us know what tomorrow brings. None of us thought last Sunday that perhaps this Sunday would be so different. And so, dear Lord, we thank you that we rely on the fact that you are unchanging. So, our Father, as we come into your presence virtually this evening, we thank you that your church are still meeting, albeit in individual homes. But, Father, there are many across this planet of ours in the persecuted church that meet maybe in the same way listen to recordings or a reading dear lord and are encouraged from your word so we thank you that what you do for them you can do for us so as we meet in this way around a telephone around a tablet around a computer this evening we pray that the presence of almighty god would be felt in every home where this service is broadcast we thank you that you are sovereign we thank you that you are God and that there is no other and that you are our rock and strong tower. Father, we can come to you and gain our strength and our security in you. And we pray that as we do so this evening, that the Holy Spirit would bless us and be with us. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. We're going to take our hymn books again and uh, I'll read... A second hymn, which is number 586, 586. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high 
and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, and his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Now we're going to turn for our reading in God's word to Matthew chapter 6, uh, the whole chapter, and uh, Esther is going to read that for us now. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. From men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand, pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father, who is in the secret place. And your Father, who sees in secret, will reward, will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions, as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If we forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites, with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces, that they may appear to be to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither not moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness. 
no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Thank you. We're going to read our third hymn uh, this evening, which is uh, number 548. 548. I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am full of sin. My soul is dark and guilty, my heart is dead within. I need the cleansing fountain where I can always flee, the blood of Christ most precious, the sinner's perfect plea. I need thee, precious Jesus, for I am very poor, a stranger and a pilgrim, I have no earthly store. I need the love of Jesus to cheer me on my way, to guide my doubting footsteps, to be my strength and stay. I need thee, precious Jesus. I need a friend like thee, a friend to soothe and comfort, a friend to care for me. I need the heart of Jesus to feel each anxious care, to tell my every trouble, and all my sorrows share. I need thee, precious Jesus, and hope to see thee soon, encircled with the rainbow and seated on thy throne. There with thy blood-brought children, my joy shall ever be to sing thy praise, Lord Jesus, to gaze, my Lord, on thee. So we're going to consider uh, for a few moments this evening the passage that Esther read to us in, chap in uh, Matthew chapter 6 and, uh, and our needs. Now last Sunday evening Joe spoke to us and he opened the service by me reading from Matthew chapter 6. And I remember thinking on that occasion, oh dear, I'm going to have my sermon stolen from me, but he didn't. Um, but it did emphasise, uh, and again with Jim on Tuesday, uh, reading from Isaiah 55, uh, that what I'd got to say and what had been laid on my heart for this evening was uh, was evident and, uh, and and needed for us, and was the Lord's word to us. So let's consider needs. It's to be under a necessity or an obligation. Inanimate things have needs. You might think, well, what are they? Well, they need to be stored correctly, perhaps. If you have books or paintings or even vehicles, they need to be protected. They need to be stored correctly. 
or they'll be damaged perhaps by mildew or mould or damp or decay. There are um, rooms uh, where documents are kept that are particularly controlled with humidity and, uh, and with temperature. Cars and vehicles need to be serviced. They need their oils changing and uh, replacement of worn parts like the brakes or the tyres. They need care, they have needs to be kept roadworthy. Animate things too, like plants, need light, warmth, moisture, food and a growing medium. Without these, they won't thrive. They need to be given the elements that they require. Animals have needs for shelter and for food, for water. Now these are general rules, but there are exceptions. But you see the point. So what about you and I? What about us? What do you need? What do I need? Now you'd be mistaken from thinking uh, in the week that we've just gone through that the main need of society and of individuals were toilet rolls in the last few days. But let's think a bit more seriously about these things. We as human beings are made up of body, mind and spirit. And each of those elements of our makeup have separate and distinct needs. So let's think first about the body. Have you heard of the rule of three? I hadn't till I did a bit of research on this, but apparently the body and our lives can be sustained for no more than three minutes without breathing. We can survive three hours without shelter in bad weather. We can survive for three days without water and we can go for three weeks without food. We have physical needs for our health. But think about it, our heart must keep breathing, beating. But you and I have no control over the beating of our heart. We must keep breathing. But you and I have no control over our breathing. Ask any asthma sufferer or anyone that suffers from a panic attack. We need shelter because we have no control over the weather or the environment. There are many in our world today that are worshipping the God of the environment and we have rightly to take care of the responsibilities that we have. But we have no control over the weather or over the environment in a larger sense. We require clean drinking water and it's available to us in bottles and through the tap, but we have no control or ability to make it so. We rely upon others to supply that need for us. We need and require food. Now some grow their own but we have no control or ability to make it grow. So therefore, every aspect of our physical needs are outside of our control. So, and as I've mentioned earlier, look at what's gone on this week with the panic and the uncertainty. People are feeling out of control. People are, have lost that certainty, that rock that's in their lives of knowing what's coming. So that's the body. What about the mind? What about our mental health? Rightly, um, in this day and age, there is more emphasis being placed on mental health. But there are many in our country and our world that are really struggling with uh, this aspect of, of their health at this time. But we need a right approach to relationships for our mental health to thrive. Otherwise, it can end in divorce or abuse. Abusive relationships can do much harm that goes on for years and years. And people struggle to come to terms with these things in their hearts and minds. We need a right approach to things, to possessions, or it can result in hoarding and materialism gone to a, a degree in which it's not designed for. We need to have a right attitude to the things that God has given us and that we have. There are many in our world today that struggle and, and have so little. 
And yet we have so much to be thankful for. But we need to hold that mentally in the right approach. We need to have the right approach to situations that we face, how we spend our time, where we work, who we spend our time with, our hobbies, our families. We, we need a healthy balance in these things. And if any of these are out of kilter, then quite easily and quite regularly we can have mental breakdowns and those that suffer from different episodes. So we need to have these things in balance. And again, many of these things are beyond our control. So we are body, we are mind, and we are also spirit. Now we need to be in a right relationship with God. Now there are many in this world of ours that would say, is there really a God? You look at what's gone on this week. If God was there, why would he allow such a thing? There can be no God. But ever since the start of the human race, all generations and all nations have always worshipped something or someone greater or beyond themselves. Whether it be spirits in a forest, whether it be the sun or the moon, the sea, gods of thunder, gods of lightning, gods of war. So you might say, well, if there's no God, why have we done this? Well, is it ignorance? Is it naivety? Superstition? Well, the animals don't, and if we've evolved from them, why do we? Evolution can't really explain why we, if we've evolved from animals, which I, I hasten to add I don't believe we did, but why do we worship? Why do we have that inner sense of the self that animals don't? Well, we all have needs and we need to know how they can be met. So with the body, we can eat well and we can exercise and we can take care of ourselves. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8 says, bodily exercise profits but a little. So that's a good thing to do, but it's not the main thing. We need to look after ourselves and to take care, yes, and eat properly, eat regularly, drink healthily, etc. But it profits but a little. For our mind, how do we look after our mind? Well, we need to, to keep things in balance and in perspective. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, is a, 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 verse, a, a passage of scripture that's been very special to me in, uh, in recent months and years. But I'll read that to you again now. It says, let your, no, beg, beg your pardon, be, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So our minds can be guarded by the peace of God. Are your hearts and minds guarded by that peace in these anxious times that we are in at this, in this week? And spiritually, we are spirit. I would say that it's probably the most important because it affects our eternal destiny. It's not just our bodies and our minds in this life, but forever and ever and ever. So why are we different from the animals? Well, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 says that God made man and woman in his image. So we're made different from the animals. We're created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. He breathed into man's nostrils and he became a living being. That's not just the drawing in of breath, but that's a spiritual living being. And secondly, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11 says that God has set eternity in the hearts of humanity. So there's that sense that we all have, that there is something greater than ourselves. Now we may suppress that, we may object to it, and, and many in this world and in this country particularly do, and would find our approach uh, reprehensible and, and distasteful. But God has set eternity in our hearts. There is that sense of need of the other, of what's outside of us. So if God has set eternity in our hearts, 
if God has made us in him, in his image, what does he say that we need? Now, I've got a list here of seven items that I believe the scripture, God's word, tells us that we need. Now, this is not an exhaustive list by any means. And feel free to look up and, uh, and post maybe on the, the group chat many more that you might find uh, and share them together. But firstly, Jesus said in John chapter 3, verse 7, you must be born again. So what do you need? You need to be born again. This is not uh, something that's open to debate or discussion. Jesus said you must. You must be born again. And in Christ Jesus, we are. Because of what he did for us on the cross, by shedding his blood for the forgiveness and the removal of our sins, we can be born again by trusting in him, by believing that Jesus is the only way, by repenting and saying sorry for our sins. That is the way to be born again. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 asked if he had to go back into his mother's womb and be born a second time. That's not the way. This is a spiritual rebirth. And we're considering that uh, this evening. You must be born again. Secondly, you need to be made alive. In spirit, remember, because you're saying, well, I'm sitting here watching this. Uh, I'm paying attention to this. I'm already alive. Yes, you are. But spiritually, we need to be made alive. And in Christ Jesus, we are and we can be. Romans chapter 6 and verse 11 says, Likewise, you yourself reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that was the verse that God used in my life when I was 17 or 18 to speak to me, and that I was to count myself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I apply that to my heart on a daily basis, that I'm dead to sin. I still sin, I still fall, I still fail. I still get it wrong on a regular basis but I am alive to God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 22 says, For in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. In Christ we're made alive. And in Ezekiel chapter 36 and 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. We have a heart of stone within us. Those that don't believe in God, those that are rebellious against spiritual things, have, as the scripture puts it, a heart of stone. But that heart needs to be replaced. We need a heart transplant, people. We need to be made alive in spiritual things. And Jesus is the only way. That, that can be done. There are other ways of being spiritual, but there's only one way to be spiritually alive. Thirdly, we need to be forgiven. Psalm 32 and verse 1 says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. And we read in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 12, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. There's a great relief and a great burden that's removed when we experience forgiveness. When perhaps we've upset a friend or a family member, when we come to them and ask for forgiveness and they say those words, I forgive you, it's a great burden lifted. If you remember Pilgrim's Progress, when he went to the cross and that burden of his sin rolled away down the hill and into the tomb and he never saw it again. That's what that forgiveness feels like. We need to be forgiven. As Christians we are, and if you're not a Christian, if you're not a follower of Christ, and this is all alien to you, as I've said earlier, you can be forgiven through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he came to do, to redeem his people and to forgive them from their sins. So we've looked at we must be born again, we must be made alive, 
we need to be forgiven. But also, we need to be fed and sustained. And we are by Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, in order that you may grow thereby, that once we've been made alive, we need to be sustained, we need to progress, we need to grow. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 says that all of them ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. That's the unity that we share together. We are brothers and sisters in Christ and we eat of the same food from this book and we are sustained by the Holy Spirit that lives and dwells within each one of us. Now we may harm him, we may hurt him, we may offend him, but we'll never get rid of him. We are fed and we are sustained by Christ. Fifthly, we need to be kept and we are by God. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. We are kept by the power of God. Our salvation and our relationship with Christ and with, the, with God does not rely upon us. Thank the Lord that it doesn't. We are kept by his power. We are held in his hands and we cannot be lost. So we need to be kept. Sixthly, we need to be loved. God has and does and will always love his children. Perhaps the most famous verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we are loved by God. He so loved the world, the people in it, that he gave his only son. That we shouldn't perish, but that we should spend eternity in his presence, forgiven and redeemed. Romans chapter 5 verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's amazing. That God didn't demonstrate his love to us because of a result of what he knew we were going to turn out like. He didn't respond to what our response would be. He demonstrates his own love to us, that while we were still rebellious sinners against him, that Jesus Christ died. 2,000 years ago, that we might know that forgiveness, that we might be right with God and be called his children. So we need to be loved, but the scripture also, as a sub-point to this, tells us that we need to love each other. It's all very well to be loved by God and to go around in our own little holy bubble, but we need to share that with others. And we can if we remember that we're all related in Christ. John chapter 13 verses 34 and 5 says a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Well, we're supposed to love one another as he has loved us. Now that's a very high bar my friends that's unattainable, but that shouldn't stop us trying. We should have a concern and a love for one another, a care for one another. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15 and 16 says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer. Your love for all the saints. We're to love one another and there are those that are easy to love and there are those that are perhaps a little bit more of a challenge to love. But we're not told that we can love the easy ones and forget about those that are more of a challenge. We're to love all the saints. 
all of our brothers and sisters in Christ. And although perhaps our personalities may clash and we may have different approaches, we may believe different things about the scripture. It doesn't say that. It says that we are to have a love for all the saints. We're to love one another. And that will be evident to those that are not Christians, to those that do not follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So is your love evident to those around you? I trust it is, and I trust that these difficult times that we can show the love of Christ. And when asked why we're doing these things, we can express that reason for the hope that's within us, that Jesus is our saviour and he is the only hope for time and for eternity. And lastly, you need to be encouraged, exhorted and urged. And we can and must as brothers and sisters in Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day of the Lord approaching. Now, we're not meeting together as we would do normally, but the desire of our heart is that we should be able to do so. So that doesn't apply to us. But we are to exhort, to encourage, to urge one another, and so much more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. And the WhatsApp group that started in the last week, I've been really encouraged by that people are posting items to encourage and to strengthen and uphold folk and perhaps those that are at home on their own and, uh, and, and haven't got the, the contact that we have with families are encouraged, I trust, by what the Lord speaks to us through these posts day by day. And we're to do this all the more as we see the day of the Lord approaching. So day by day, our love, our concern, our urging, our encouragement to one another should be ratcheted up. It shouldn't be less, it should be more. And we trust this, that this might be to God's glory and to our blessing. So just to recap, God tells us in his word that you must be born again. You need to be made alive. You need to be forgiven. You need to be fed and sustained. You need to be kept. You need to be loved and you need to love each other, and you need to encourage and exhort one another. And I trust that we can put these things into practice in this coming week and in these coming days. Now, that's what God tells us that we need in his word. And as I said earlier, this is not an exhaustive list. And if you find others, then please do share. But how do we apply this to ourselves? Well, we need to be very careful when we say, we have something that we need. God has told us in the list we've just looked at the things that he says we need. But when I say I have a need, I need to be very careful. Well, why, why do I need to do that? Why do I need to be careful with what I name as a need? Well, let me give you an example. I have uh, a daughter and uh, she went to secondary school. And when she started secondary school, we bought her a telephone so that if the, she missed the bus, she's got a method of uh, communicating with us. However, after a very short period of time, uh, she came back saying that every one house had a BlackBerry. and She must have a BlackBerry because she was the only one in the entire school that didn't have one. Now, when I explained as her dad that she had a perfectly good phone and she didn't really need a BlackBerry, did she respond by saying, Oh, Dad, what a wise father I have been blessed with. You've seen through my distorted sense of need and have recognised my selfish desire and have lovingly rescued me from me. Well, I'm sorry to tell you that no, she didn't. What she actually said was something to the effect of, Oh, that's not fair. Why am I the only one without a black? And incidentally, she never did get that blackberry. So why is it important when we name a need? Well, when we tell ourselves that we have a need for something, three things happen. Firstly, you feel entitled to the thing, because after all, it's a need. 
I must have it. Secondly, because it's a need, you feel it's your right to demand it. And we're seeing that in the world in which we live, even at this moment. And thirdly, you then judge the love of another person by his or her willingness to deliver that thing or that need to you. So you feel entitled, you feel it's your right to demand it, and you judge other people by their love and compassion in their willingness to deliver that thing. Now, I'm sure Lydia didn't think highly of me as her dad when I wouldn't buy her a Blackberry. But be careful when we smile at these things and when we, we laugh. And if you've had children, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. It might not be a Blackberry, but it will be a game console or it will be a pair of trainers or uh, shoes or whatever it may be. We have to be careful when we name a need. Now, this not only happens in our relationship with each other, but more importantly, it can happen in our relationship with God. When you tell him that you need something and God doesn't deliver it or supply it, you begin to doubt his goodness. And what is deadly about this to our spiritual lives is that you don't run to help from someone whose character you've come to doubt. If somebody's let you down and failed you, you don't easily go back to them. Once bitten, twice shy is the expression that we use. But when that's on the spiritual realm and we doubt the character and the love of God, that can be almost awful to our spiritual health and well-being because his character is perfect, his will and his way is always best. Jesus reminds us in the chapter that we read together, in chapter 6 and verse 32, let's turn back to it, chapter 6 and verse 32, it says, For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And in verse 8, Therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. But there is confrontation and comfort in Jesus' words in verse 32. So why is there confrontation? The, G the reason Jesus reminds us that we have a Heavenly Father who has clear understanding of our true needs is because we don't have such an understanding, because we forget because we get so self-absorbed and self-focused that we forget that he has our best interests at heart and he knows the end from the beginning. We constantly get needs and wants muddled up and confused. And when we do, we are tempted to question the love of our Heavenly Father. My urge to you this evening is don't do it. Remember that God is in control and he does know what's best for us. So that's the confrontation in those words in verse 32. What about the comfort? Well, by grace, we have been made the children of the wisest, most loving father the universe has ever known. He is never confused. He knows our every need because he created us. We were created in his image, as we thought at the beginning of this sermon. We can rest in his grace, that we are his children, knowing that our place in his family guarantees that we will always have what we need. So don't worry about your life, your body, your clothing, food, drink, or even worry about tomorrow. According to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34, read it and reread it. Read it every day for the coming week. Trust it and rely on your Heavenly Father because he cares for you. I'm going to close our time together this evening by reading our last hymn, which is number um, 546, 546. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Saviour. 
I come to thee. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour, in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, for life is vain. I need thee every hour, teach me thy will, and thy rich promises in me fulfil. I need thee every hour, most holy one. O oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. I need thee, O oh, I need thee, every hour I need thee. O oh, bless me now, my Saviour, I come to thee. As we close our service this evening, let me just um, conclude with those last few ver couple of verses from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Saviour, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever.